what I'm going to talk about today is based on four psychological theories that we understand from experimental research that academics have done in laboratories. And there is still some academic debate about all of this, but I would argue that we now have enough information out there to actually help us understand what we should and shouldn't be doing. So the first psychological effect is called the familiarity backfire effect, which is by repeating falsehoods in order to correct them, debunks can make falsehoods more familiar and thus more likely to be accepted as true. Now, this does not mean that you must never talk about the rumor. And there is recent research that says it's okay if you juxtapose it with the truth right next to it. The problem is when you've only got the size of a tweet or you've only got the size of the headline, you actually don't have a lot of space for that nuance. Be really wary about repeating the falsehoods because remember, not everybody is on social media all day long. So they might not have seen it. And that actually, if you're a CNN or a BBC or you've got a big following, by debunking it, you could actually make it more available to people who otherwise hadn't heard it. And one thing I want to stress right now is that human beings are lovely, but we've got terrible brains. And our brains right now are overwhelmed with information. And also many of us are very frightened. And in that context, our brains are even less likely to work effectively, and we are less likely to be critical. So we just need to be even more careful about where we put rumors and how we discuss them. So taking this as one of the most important effects I want you to think about, best practice is avoid repeating a falsehood unnecessarily while correcting it. Where possible, warn readers before repeating falsehoods. And rather than say, here's the myth, here's the myth, here's the myth, can you just frame it in a way that tells people what they need to know? And that isn't always easy, but that's really what we should be doing right now. Because here's an example of very easy to do. It's a fact sheet. We see these all the time, like five myths about coronavirus. But when you list all the myths separately, our brains are really bad at making sense of facts versus myths in a, in a situation like this. Here's Medical News Today doing exactly the same thing. And if I'm scrolling down a page and the highlighted text is the text that's wrong, that's just really difficult for our brains to make sense of. So number three, children cannot catch COVID-19. Well, the text shows us that that's more nuanced, but actually if that's all I see and my eyes are drawn to it, it can be a real challenge. Let's think about Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for a second. When people are scrolling and it comes to them, they might not even know that it's an issue that they need to be worried about yet, but all of a sudden they see it and they're more likely to be concerned and you haven't necessarily got the space to do the full debunking. And it's not quite the same, but here's an example of a tweet which says, coronavirus, oil collapse erased 5 trillion from US stocks. I'm immediately terrified and there isn't really space there to give me more information. So just a reminder that what we put out in places where people are scrolling and stumbling, we need to be even more aware of. But when it comes to places like Google, Bing or YouTube, which are obviously search engines, often people are going to specifically search for quality information about a rumor that they have heard. And in those contexts, it's actually not terrible to repeat the rumor in the headline because people are actively searching and we want there to be quality information available to them when they do these searches. Because if they search and there's nothing there but conspiracies and misinformation, then we're in trouble. But I think it's really important to make that distinction. So here's an example on YouTube about, you know, the rumor, you know, does coronavirus travel on a package? And the second uh, example down, KHOU, uh, can you get the coronavirus from packages from China? They have specifically added that rumor to the headline, 4,000 views. This is from a month ago. But you can see what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes actually creating explainer content to help fill these information vacuums. In that context, it's, you know, you might decide that it's actually worth adding the um, rumor into the headline because you're hoping you'll get people to click and then to watch your explainer or to read your full article. The second psychological theory is the overkill backfire effect. The easier information is to process, the more likely it is to be accepted. Less detail can be more effective. Rare possible, try and make your content easy to process by keeping it simple, short and easy to read. Use graphics to illustrate your points. And we've already seen some really powerful graphics when it comes to COVID. And so the most famous one, I think, is this flattening the curve, which showed that the reason that we all need to stay indoors is because if there is a very quick spike, it will put unnecessary pressure on hospitals and we won't be able to cope. And so this graphic, I think, did the most uh, work to make people understand this, uh, the reasons why we had to stay inside. Uh, and I think well, for many was an explanation of why diagrams matter. This is another one um, created by a journalist in the UK. 
took s some information from the CDC and turned it into kind of a cute graphic. Like this is much more likely to be shared by people on WhatsApp or in Facebook, you know, where possible, let's try and humanize this content. Let's try and make it less scary. Uh, let's try and find uh, ways to simplify all this information. This is a GIF that just appeared this morning. I saw it on my social media, which is a way of, again, trying to explain to people why social distancing matters. Um, and I, it's really, really simple. It's beautiful. Again, how can we do more of this rather than 800 word articles? And the WHO have actually partnered with Pinterest to create these pins. I'm really glad that there are kind of simpler ways of trying to explain this. But again, look, there's a lot of text on these pins. Um, wherever possible, yes, it's not that I'm saying no text, but how can we use visuals and diagrams to explain things to people right now who are scrolling and sharing very, very quickly. Um, and we need to take complex ideas and make them more simple. So the third um, psychological theory is the worldview backfire effect. People process information in biased ways. When debunks threaten a person's worldview, those most fixed in their views can double down. And I think many people have struggled in the last couple of weeks to talk to their parents who are older and are like, oh, there's nothing here, be quiet, of course I can go shopping. You have to think about language that's gonna work with people because if you say to somebody you are wrong and here's a fact checking article that proves that you're wrong, people are actually more likely to double down on their views rather than be like, oh, thanks for sharing that fact checking article, that's so helpful. And that's because of this psychological theory. So we should be using language which is like, wow, yeah, you know, I actually have seen some of these um, posts as well, mum and dad, but you know, actually, I, I'm looking at a lot of this and I'm actually really worried because I'm worried about our community. I'm worried about why, you know, we are going to suffer if we don't do this. And so it's language like we and us and community. And so here's um, an, another thing to remember is wherever possible, try and avoid ridicule or derogatory comments. Don't say, oh, you know, you're crazy for thinking this. Like, you're insane. Can't you see what's happening? Like, we have to find ways to talk to one another that isn't about you're right, I'm wrong. Uh, and the way that we do that is by using language that's about connection and it's about community. And here's an example of a, a message. I actually received this on a closed messaging app. And I'll be honest, I forwarded it because, as you can see, somebody said from a credible source. It wasn't. It was a rumor. Um, but in this example, we can say, you know, I can say to people now, look, all of us have got these messages. You know, I made a mistake. I shared this, too. But, you know, if we do this and we all get panicked and we all share false information, we're actually going to be in trouble when we do get into a situation when there is a lockdown or if there is a case where we can only go to the grocery store at 6 p.m. I mean, whatever happens, we have to say to people, all of us are part of this. It's not journalists are right, people at home are wrong. All of us right now are, you know, social distancing, we're isolated, and that kind of language is much more effective. And finally, missing alternatives. Labeling something as false but not providing explanation often leaves people with questions. If a debunker doesn't answer these questions, people will continue to rely on bad information. So if you think about our brains as filing cabinets and you have a file in your brain that's actually a rumor because somebody's told you something and you've believed it. If somebody else comes along and says, you know, you're, you're wrong, that's false, um, you know, that's not, that's not true, then you take that file out of your filing cabinet brain but if you don't fill that hole in your filing cabinet, then the filing cabinet, just like a concertina, goes back and needs to fill that hole. So it will fill that hole with the old information. So you need to provide an explanation for why those false rumors might be spreading. And so here, um, this is all about kind of answering questions. And an example might be people who are trying to sell supplements. So right now we're seeing a lot of misinformation about many, many different different medications, different supplements, different fruits and vegetables that people are saying, this is gonna cure coronavirus. Well, some of this is just people trying to help, they don't mean any harm, but some people are pushing this because they want to make money right now. And so by explaining to somebody, well, actually, people are trying to sell this supplement, that's why they're telling you it's a cure, that gives people a reason to be like, oh, okay, I understand now, and I've got something to replace that hole in my brain because you've provided me with that explanation. Be precise with language. Are you talking about tests or cases? Are you talking about how many people have died or how many people have survived? Right now, there's a lot of confusion. And if we're not careful with the language that we use, then people more generally are going to kind of turn away. And I would argue in the last three weeks, there was a lot of discussion about how young people were not at risk, but you should stay at home to make sure that older members of the public are safe. Well, now new numbers seem to be suggesting that there are people under 50 who are getting coronavirus and ending up in hospital. And I've definitely seen conversations amongst younger people saying, well, I don't trust the news media now. They told me I was fine. And now I find out I'm not. So we also need to let people know that these things are changing all the time. 
So just to finish up, number one, focus on facts where possible. Secondly, make your content easy to process by keeping it simple, short and easy to read. Avoid ridicule or derogatory comments. Answer any questions that a debunk might arise. And that's often about who is spreading this and why might they be spreading misinformation. But uh, I'm just going to say this. It's not easy to write headlines that fill all of these best practices, but we're sharing them with you so that you can hopefully, where possible, make changes so that you can really focus on the facts.